I'm Alex Witsi. I'm the Washington Bureau Chief for Nature. I'm Todd Hooksema. I'm at the Stanford University and I'm involved with the SDO mission that's coming up, also with the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory and with the Wilcox Solar Observatory. And so I'm kind of an observer and a helioseismologist and a magnetic field guy and do all that thing. Can you start off, Todd, by telling us a little bit about how historically scientists have gotten a sense of what's going on inside the sun? I mean, we look up at it every day, it's kind of this bright, featureless blob. How did people start to get a sense historically of what the structure was like inside? Well, it's an interesting story. Um, it started back in the 1960s when they first saw these oscillations. So the sun's surface was moving in and out with a five minute period, but nobody really understood what they were for a long time until someone had the right idea to look for how they were moving across the sun from one direction to another. And when they did that averaging, they found that they were structured and that the size of the scale pattern, the, the, in other words, the spatial scale, told something about what was happening inside what the periods were were related to the size scale of, of the motions. And so what they eventually figured out was that the sun was vibrating like a bell. So a bell has certain frequencies, certain tones that come out more, um, more obviously because they resonate and the things that don't resonate because the, the, the spatial scale isn't quite right. So by putting those things together, they found that they could, they could identify these resonances and it turns out there are a million of them inside the surface, inside the sun. And with those million, each one of those million resonances probes a different part of the interior. And by measuring carefully what the frequency was, how fast the oscillations were occurring, they could tell whether, what the motions were, they could tell what the temperature was inside the sun, they could tell something about the motions of the material along which the rays were propagating, they could tell what it was made out of. So it was a very interesting process. So how do you actually observe these waves? I mean, what's, is, it, is it satellite observations? Is it ground-based observations? What, what kind of measurements can you take to figure out what's going on? You can do it in a couple different ways. Uh, what we do is we measure the surface of the sun, and it vi I said it vibrates in and out. So we measure the velocity, the, the amount of m motion in and out. It's kind of like measuring the surface of an audio speaker. And you can kind of tell that it's moving in and out. And that's what, it's responding to the sound waves inside the sun that are bouncing off the surface. Uh, you can measure it from the ground, or you can measure it from space. There's a ground-based network called GONG, and there's a space uh, mission called SOHO uh, that's been measuring the sun for the last 10 years, both about the same amount of time. The, the important thing is that you have to measure these things for a long time continuously if you want to get the frequencies just right, and we're measuring these frequencies extremely accurate, accurately. And so you have to measure for long times without any interruptions, and so that's why you either go to space or you do it from the ground, but then you have to have a network of stations around the world so that you can still watch the sun for 24 hours at a time. And so what changes do you see in some of these internal nodes during the solar cycle? We've talked a lot this morning about the 11-year solar cycle and how sunspots wax and wane. What kind of changes do you see in the internal structure or in uh, what you can deduce about the internal structure over the solar cycle? Anything? Oh yeah, you can see a lot of things. Um, every time a sunspot appears on the surface, it's like a little disturbance. Um, and what that does is it tends to change all of these frequencies. Um, and so, in fact, you can, you can detect things on the far side of the sun, you can detect things on the near side of the sun. You can do what was called global uh, helioseismology, where you're looking at the resonance of the whole sun. When there's a lot of activity, those frequencies tend to shift just a little bit, and it's very correlated with the, the amount of activity on the whole surface of the sun. So you can track that with time. Locally, you can watch the waves as they propagate through the sunspots. And because the sunspots are a different temperature, because the magnetic field is there, and because the density changes, you can actually change, you can see how the, how the propagation, how the motion of those waves across the sunspot changes with time. And so you can, you can use that as a probe to figure out happen what's happening in the places that you can't see. Right. Tell us a little bit about what's going on underneath sunspots. So we sort of, I think a lot of people think of them as two-dimensional things. They see a, you know, a dark blob on the surface. Mm -hmm. But you, you've shown us pictures about what happens if you sort of invert that and look at it in three dimensions. Tell us what that's like beneath the sunspot. Well, sunspots are usually about the size of the Earth or the size of Jupiter. Or they can actually range in, in a wide variety of, of sizes. And they're deeper than they are in terms of the size that you see on the surface. They're, they're like plants that have a deep root. And so it's that taproot that we kind of want to look at um, with this process. And what we found, it, it was kind of a surprise, is that at the surface, of course, we, we know that the sunspots are cool because they're darker and you can measure the temperature and so you see they're cool. But what was underneath was kind of a mystery. They, we thought that they were cool for some distance underneath. What we discovered a couple of years ago was that if you go down about the diameter of the sunspot or a little bit less, then all of a sudden beneath that it starts getting hotter again, mm. hotter than the average amount. So you have a cool spot overlying a hot spot. Why is that? 
Well, because the energy is blocked. So the magnetic field is concentrated and it blocks the transfer of the energy that's coming from the inside because all the energy comes from the inside. So if it's blocked at some point, then what it does is it kind of piles up there until it finds a way to get around it and that sets up a circulation pattern. But if it's blocked at that particular spot, it will get hot underneath and cooler because within the spot, the radiation is transferred outward more quickly because of the... Huh because of the, uh, the changes in the characteristics of the density. Right, right, okay. What about seeing to the far side of the sun? There are some interesting things you guys can do in terms of probing the side that's on the other side from Earth that otherwise we wouldn't be able yeah. to see. How do, how do you do that? Oh, this is really interesting. If, if you look at the sound waves, they, they, they bounce around inside the sun. So if you can imagine the sun being a ball and, and things bouncing around inside. The sun, things from the far side of the sun bounce toward the surface that, that we can see. And so if you can track the waves that originate in one spot on the far side of the sun and see where they bounce to the front side of the sun, then you can, you can use that as a probe. And by, using, by, by carefully selecting where you're looking and, and moving that, it, it turns out it's a disk, okay, it's because you, you have to be the same distance away from that far side piece. If you look at that annulus, you can, you can use that to focus on one spot. And so if, if you measure the waves, the time difference between when the wave leaves the far side of the sun to the near side of the sun, there's a difference of a few seconds in how long it takes for that wave to, to propagate. If there is a sunspot there, it takes, say, two and a half hours. And if, it, if there is a sunspot, it takes two and a half hours plus four seconds. Mm -hmm. So there's a small change in the frequency that you can measure in those waves that are coming from the far side of the sun. It's really pretty cool. Hmm. So what does it gain you to know that there's sunspots on the far side? I mean, eventually they're going to rotate around and you'll see them anyway. What does it gain you knowing that they're going to come? Well, right now, the only ones that we can see are the biggest ones. The smaller ones, we don't have enough sensitivity yet. So if you know that there's going to be a big, huge sunspot coming, you can prepare for space weather effects. Okay. Um, so that's really the main interesting. Plus, you can, you can follow things for long periods of time. You can tell when they disappear as well. So it gives you a longer peri period of time that you can track something from, from the Earth perspective. Now, there are spacecraft in, up now, the stereo spacecraft, that are at different longitudes around the Earth. So if you were the sun, Mm -hmm. Stereo 1 would be over here, stereo behind it over here, I would be the Earth. Mm -hmm. We have three perspectives, but we still can't see what's on the back side of your head. Right, so right. That, that's why it's interesting. So if you had unlimited money and you could design a mission from scratch, mm. where would your solar mission go? Would it be a solar orbiter? What kinds of things would it carry? What, what would like your mm. design from the bottom up, NASA's going to give you all the money for it, Ooh. look like? There, there would be, I think there would be two things that, that are really interesting, and, and I don't know if I could pick between them, but let me tell you what the two things are. Um, one is to measure things with very, very high resolution. In other words, see things happening in the very finest scales. Um, right now, we can see things on the sun that are maybe 50 miles across. Mm -hmm. Well, if you took a picture of the Earth and the smallest thing you could see was 50 miles across, you'd miss a lot of the interesting details, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, so building a big telescope that could look at the sun, I think, is interesting. Now, they're going to do that from the ground, um, but to do it from space would be interesting as well because you don't have all the atmospheric distortions that you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. But I think maybe the, the more interesting or the, the more unexplored regions are the sun's poles. So the Earth orbits around the equator of the, of the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you could go to higher latitudes, then you could see what's happening up at the polar regions. And right now, we, we hardly get a, a look at that at all. Mm -hmm. The Earth is always within seven degrees of the Earth's equator. And so everything that's up there is very foreshortened, and we don't get a very good look at it. We can only see it, in fact, half the year. We can't even see one of the poles of the sun. And the other half of the year, we can, o we can only see the other pole. So I think if we could have a mission that would go into high orbit, orbit at high latitudes and then take, be able to take pictures and do the seismology so that we could figure out what's happening underneath the, the poles of the sun, I think that would be an interesting place to look. What's sort of the biggest misconception about the sun that you run into from the general public? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I think probably the main thing is that people tend to think of the sun as a big, unchanging yellow ball. And I think what we've learned over the last few years is that it changes a lot. Um, and that at any time scale, any, any spatial scale you look at, there's a lot of variability, and it affects the Earth. Mm -hmm. We think of the sun as being just that constant thing up there. But in fact, the sun has a lot of things that are going on and, uh, with the magnetic field, with the solar cycle, with coronal mass ejections, with solar flares, with rotation, <laughs> the list goes on and on, that all have practical effects on our life here on Earth. And I think if you can put those things together, understand the system, from the sun to the earth, that's going to be really important. Great. Thanks for your time. Sure. You're welcome.